So this next video will come in two parts. The first part being the dissociation of ionic compounds, and the second part being the acid, base, and buffer chemistry of biological molecules that we will encounter over the course of the year. So if we're going to talk about ionic compounds, it's important to remember that ions are simply atoms that have lost or gained an electron due to electron transfer. And we talked earlier that elements in groups 1, 2, and 7 tend to be those elements that will form ions readily. So, for example, sodium in group 1 tends to form a positively charged ion, and elements in group 7, like fluorine, tend to form negatively charged ions because they gain electrons from, um, from well, atoms like sodium. But don't forget, we also have polyatomic ions, and polyatomic ions are they're not really molecules, they're, they're compounds that are more complex than single element ions, uh, but together these atoms will form a compound that has an electric charge. So again, you're familiar with these um, from ninth grade. Uh, polyatomics like ammonium or hydroxide or phosphate are all compounds of different elements that collectively will, uh, will have an electric charge. So if we're going to talk about ionic dissociation, we first have to be reminded of what is an ion. So remember that ions are simply atoms that have gained or lost electrons. If we're looking at atoms that will typically form ions, we're focusing on those elements in groups 1, 2, or 7. So remember, if you have an element in group 1 and an element in group 7, those two elements, or atoms of that element, will tend to form ionic compounds with each other as one atom, in this case the atom from group 1, will lose the electron and become positively charged and transfer that electron. So again, you've seen this slide before. These are the polyatomic ions that you should know for biology. All of those polyatomic ions that you need to know are in bold, but it's the same list that you learned about in ninth grade. Again, more of the polyatomics that you need to be able to identify um, for this class. So what do ionic compounds have to do with biology? Well, if I were to take an ionic compound like sodium chloride, remember sodium's in group 1 and chlorine's in group 7, those elements will tend to form an ionic compound, and I add them to water, I'd be willing to bet that you could tell me that that sodium chloride will dissolve. But we need to go beyond that. What about the sodium chloride allows it to dissolve in water? I bet you could identify the solute as sodium chloride and the solvent as water. But can we actually look at what's happening at the molecular level and understand what happens when a solute dissolves in a solvent? Notice that over here on the right-hand side, I have a blown-up view of the sodium chloride crystal that I added to the water. Notice that the water molecules, because they're polar, begin to attack this ionic crystal. And as they do so, they begin to free some of the individual ions from the crystal. So you can see here, these water molecules haven't just freed the positively charged sodium ion from the crystal, they're also surrounding it. And they're surrounding it based on their charge. The negative end of the water molecule is going to be pointed towards the positively charged ion, because of the opposite, uh, oppositely charged regions of the water molecule. Uh, and down here, the positive side of the water molecule is attracted to the negatively charged uh, chloride ion because of the oppositely charged regions uh, in the water molecule. So taken over the course of time, uh, this we would expect that these water molecules, because there's going to be many, 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 many more of them compared to the individual ions that make up the ionic compound, to be able to break apart the, uh, the crystal and generate the individual ions that would then be floating in the solution. And keep in mind that these ions will not come back together because they are surrounded by water molecules. In fact, the only way to get the ionic compound to, re be to regenerate would be to remove all of the water. And I bet you can think about a way uh, where we could do that. Here's another look at the same process. Again, you have your sodium chloride crystal, and you have your water molecules that are attacking that crystal causing it to break apart, causing it to dissociate, and we can see here again the water molecules surrounding each of the individual ions that once made up the ionic compound. Okay, so that's part one, understanding a little bit about the dissociation of ionic compounds. Next, let's go on to acids, bases, and buffer chemistry. And what's nice about acid, bases, and buffers is that if you understand dissociation, you're well on your way to understanding acid-base chemistry.
We already know that water is special because water is polar and has two oppositely charged regions, the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged hydrogens. Well, what we didn't talk about last time is that water, much like uh, other ionic compounds, can break apart. It can dissociate. And when water dissociates, it actually forms two new species. It forms a hydronium ion, H3O+, and OH-, one of the polyatomics that you are already familiar with. Now, we do have to make a note that while water does dissociate, it doesn't dissociate very often. Only about two of, out of a billion water molecules are actually dissociated at any one time. So most of the time, the H2O that we're familiar with is the H2O that's going to be present. But every now and then, that water molecule will break apart into hydronium and hydroxide. So for simplicity's sake, we're actually going to refer to hydronium, H3O+, as just H+. So if you see hydronium, just think about H+, because it, that actually might make more sense to you. If we think about this is H+, and this is, uh, this is OH-, minus, H+, plus, plus OH- minus will, of course, form water. And the reason why we, have, we would have the water over here is because that water molecule dissociated. In this diagram, you're just seeing the proton jump from one water molecule to the other water molecule to form hydronium, and what's left over, the OH-. Minus. Okay. But again, water dissociates very, very infrequently. So if that water molecule can dissociate, even if it only happens very infrequently, there must be other compounds that dissociate and release that H plus more frequently. The only way we can know if a chemical compound releases that H plus is to measure the amount of H plus that might be present in the solution after the compound dissociates. And we measure the amount of H plus uh, present in a solution using the pH scale. Uh, the pH scale is going to be important for us in a variety of ways. Uh, first off, the pH scale is going to be important because organisms only tend to be able to live within a particular range of pH values. In fact, the typical blood pH um, in your body right now is about 7.35 to 7.45, depending on what you're doing. If your blood pH were to jump to 7.5 or, or 7.6, you would be dead. There's no doubt about that, unless, of course, you were to receive medical intervention in the, uh, in the time uh, that was available. Okay, so why is this important to us? If that pH range needs to be held constant, or at least within a very, a very discrete range, uh, it's important that we understand what the pH scale is actually telling us. Typically, the pH scale is going to run from 14 to 0. Uh, a pH of 0 is a very, very, very strong pH value, and we're never going to see a pH value that low in biology. Uh, a pH value of 14 is very, very basic, and similarly, we're not going to find pH values typically anywhere near 14 within or around a living organism. We're typically going to find pH values in this range, somewhere between 6.5 and 7.5. But note, there are lots of other molecules, lots of other substances that you have come in contact with in your lifetime that have very discrete pH values. So, for example, gastric fluid or stomach acid has a very low pH. That's not surprising. But look at the pH of carbonated beverages compared to the pH of uh, stomach acid. They're really not that different. And I move up to the other side of the scale, uh, molecules like bleach or ammonia are actually very, very basic, um, just, just as a point of comparison. So if we know that the pH scale runs from 0 to 14, it's going to be useful, again, to be able to use that pH scale as a way to measure the amount of H plus in solution. And there's a very simple mathematical relationship that we can use to, met, to, to, to calculate the pH if we have the H plus concentration. Now, unfortunately, as a sophomore, at this point in the year, you're not familiar with logarithms yet, but you will be as a sophomore by the end of the year. Freshman, you're going to have to wait almost a year and a half to be uh, more familiar with this concept. But if we, if we know the H plus concentration, and those brackets simply are shorthand for concentration, we can plug this into uh, a formula and with our calculator determine the pH value. And you had a couple of those problems for homework the other night. Uh, there is a way to solve for H plus concentration if we know the pH. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this class right now. Uh, again, if we know, if we can calculate the pH, so if we know the H plus concentration and we know and we can calculate the pH, we can determine whether or not a solute substance is acidic um, because the pH will be less than 7, and we can determine if the substance is basic because the pH will be greater than 7. If we have a solution that is exactly at pH 7, that substance will be neutral.
All right. So the biggest problem with pH when it comes to understanding acid-base chemistry is that because we're working with a logarithmic scale, remember pH equals the negative log of the H plus concentration, every change in a single pH unit actually refers to a tenfold difference in H plus concentration. So if I move up one unit on the pH scale, I'm actually going to be decreasing the H plus concentration by a factor of 10. So remember, I'm moving up the pH scale, so I would say I'm going from pH 2 to pH 3, so the solution is becoming less acidic, it's becoming more basic, that would mean that the H plus concentration is actually going to be um, decreasing rather than increasing. This is something to keep in mind when you work with uh, the pH scale and you work with logarithms. A single unit change actually leads to a tenfold change in the H plus concentration. So how will we actually measure the pH of the solution? Well, we're lucky enough to actually have digital pH meters that we'll be able to hook, up and hook under the computer, and the, P the meter and the computer will give us the pH value. Uh, we'll also use pH paper, I'll show you that on the next slide, where based on the color of the pH paper, after you dip it into a certain substance, we'll be able to measure the pH, at least qualitatively. It's not going to be the most quantitative measurement as compared to the pH meter, but it will give us an indication of the relative pH value of that substance. And there are other ways that you'll experience in chemistry where you'll actually add a chemical that changes color based on the pH of the solution. So here's an example of a piece, or really it's a pH, pH paper key that would tell you the pH of the solution based on uh, the color change of the paper after, after placing it into the substance. Uh, numbers aren't the easiest thing to read, but um, I put the numbers down below. So we're dealing with a, a pink color for something that was close to pH 0, and something uh, with a blue color that might be close to pH 13. All right, so we're almost done here. Let's put this, put this all together. If ionic compounds can dissociate, then what exactly is an acid? Well, luckily, acids are simply substances that release protons, which means they also must be dissociating. They must be breaking apart. So if I have a substance that is capable of releasing H+, that is capable of releasing a proton uh, due to dissociation, I'm dealing with a substance that is going to be acting as an acid. And the amount of dissociation will be proportional to the strength of the acid. If I look at a common acid that we'll be working with in lab, hydrochloric acid, uh, we consider hydrochloric acid to be a strong acid because it dissociates completely in water. So if I place HCl into water, it's going to behave a lot like sodium chloride will. It will break apart completely into H plus and Cl minus ions. Each of those ions will become surrounded by water molecules, and uh, they will not come back together under, um, under normal circumstances. And consequently, because the H plus has dissociated from the HCl, the H plus concentration in that solution will be increasing. I can measure that change in H plus, and if, right, if by now you haven't picked up on this, if the H plus concentration increases, then the pH must be decreasing. So those are acids. What are bases? Well, typically bases are substances that don't release H plus into solution, but instead release OH minus into solution. Alternatively, bases can actually absorb H plus from a solution, thus decreasing the amount of H plus in solution and increasing the pH. That's going to work um, very simply when an H plus in solution combines with OH minus in solution to form water. But the take home message here is that the H plus concentration actually will decrease as a result of the addition of the base, which will cause the pH to go up. All right, so those are your adsins and bases. But in biology, we're often going to create scenarios or, or, or systems where we don't want the pH to change very much because, again, organisms tend to exist within very, nor very narrow ranges of pH values. So how do organisms maintain those narrow ranges of pH? Well, they do so with the use of buffers. Buffers are going to prevent large changes in pH and will keep organisms or will help organisms maintain that normal pH range that will promote survivability. So what is a buffer? A buffer is a mixture, and you learned about mixtures in ninth grade. Um, mixtures in this, in this case, this will be a homogeneous mixture, but the mixture will be composed of a weak acid and a weak base, and that's important. Buffers are not single substances. They are not pure substances. They are mixtures of two, at least two different substances. And I've given you an example down, he, down here. I, so I can make a buffer by mixing an acid with a base. And in this example, my acid is hydrogen bicarbonate, and my base is bicarbonate ion.
Can you see how one is the acid and one is the base? Look at it for a second. If this is the base and it were to come in contact with the H+, plus, with the proton, wouldn't I regenerate the acid? Okay. So if the H plus concentration were to increase, I would expect that the bicarbonate ion in my buffer would be able to neutralize the addition of the H plus, thus not causing the pH to change very much. Uh, conversely, if I were to be adding base to the solution, I know that the, that the base, the OH minus, would react with the H plus and form water. Well, if that's true, I'd be losing H plus in solution. And you, what we have to begin to ask yourself is, if I don't want the pH to change very much because I'm working with under buffered conditions, there has to be a way to regenerate the H plus that I'm losing as the OH minus is being added to solution. Well, that additional H plus would come from the acid part of my buffer. We'll go through other examples of this in class so that it makes more sense, but for right now I want to just introduce you to this idea that buffers maintain pH values because they are a mixture of acids and bases. If I add H+, there's base present to neutralize the H+, and thus not allow the pH to change very much. If I add OH-, and I begin to absorb some of that H+, there's acid present in the buffer to produce more H+, thus again keeping the H+, concentration relatively constant, and not causing the pH to change very much. All right, last slide. Why do we care about pH? Well, we care about pH because in biology, we can say that there needs to be a narrow pH, uh, a narrow range of pH values that allow the organism to stay alive. But what is actually happening, or what would happen if the pH were to change? Well, as we'll see later on in this unit, there are going to be enzymes that are responsible for catalyzing, for allowing different chemical reactions to take place, that would not work if the pH of a cell or the pH outside of a cell were changed dramatically. So consequently, if the enzyme didn't work and that enzyme were responsible for catalyzing an important biochemical reaction, if the reaction couldn't take place, that might put the organism's life in jeopardy. Um, so that's really, that's point number two here. Um, keep in mind, too, that there are different parts of your body that have different pH values. So again, you're familiar with stomach acid, and the pH of that stomach acid is very, very low. But in the next part, of your intestinal tract, hopefully you, you are aware that the stomach is attached to the small intestine, the, the, in, the inside of the small intestine have a pH of 7. Well, how is that possible? How does something that's so acidic be brought to a pH of much, much closer to 7 in a space sometimes as little as a foot or two feet? And there's a hint here on the screen, the pancreas actually does something that helps bring that pH of the stomach acid uh, much closer to pH 7. Uh, and finally, as we'll see later on in this unit, there are going to be compounds and other large molecules, macromolecules simply refers to uh, large molecules, that are going to have a buffering capacity. Um, that bicarbonate system that I showed you on the previous slide will be one of those systems, but there are going to be others that we encounter as well. So short story long, uh, buffers are really important to maintain the the pH environment of cells or the environment outside of cells. If we didn't maintain that environment, we could put the organism's life in jeopardy. And all of this is based upon our knowledge of acids and bases and the dissociation of ionic compounds, as we saw at the beginning of the video. So hopefully this video helped you understand uh, dissociation, acid, base, and buffer chemistry a little bit better. We will elaborate this on class in class next time. Um, please come and see me if you have any additional questions.